Hello and thank you for joining this OncLive Peer Exchange titled Redefining Advanced Prostate Cancer with Novel Imaging. Androgen Deprivation Therapy, or ADT, is the mainstay of initial treatment for advanced prostate cancer. But for many men, disease progression, despite castration levels of serum testosterone, invariably leads to endocrine or castration-resistant prostate cancer, also known as CRPC. What we do know is that the androgen receptor axis continues to drive disease progression in many of these patients. Despite multiple approvals over the past seven years for therapies in MCRPC, these therapies have not been approved for non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, or M0-CRPC. In this OncLive peer exchange, I am joined by a panel of experts in the field of genitourinary oncology. In today's discussion, we will define four phenotypes of advanced prostate cancer and will provide practical definitions for these patient subtypes. We will also discuss the availability of next generation biologic imaging and how these novel agents may affect these current definitions as well as treatment choices in advanced prostate cancer. I'm Dr. Raul Concepcion, the director of the Comprehensive Prostate Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Daniel George, Director of Genitourinary Oncology at Duke Cancer Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Alec Koo, a urologist with Skyline Urology in Southern California. Dr. Philip Koo, Division and Chief of Diagnostic Imaging at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center in Phoenix, Arizona. And Dr. Neil Shore, Medical Director for the Carolina Urologic Research Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us and let's begin. Gentlemen, in this first segment, what I thought we would do is again, give our audience sort of some working definitions and sort of management schemes on the, on the various phases as patients progress in the whole journey of prostate cancer. So in this first segment, I think let's, let's talk about biochemical recurrent hormone naive non-metastatic prostate cancer patients. So again, these are patients that have been definitively treated and we know that depending upon certain, the, the, the Gleason score at the time of diagnosis and treatment, there are some certain risk factors that those patients, despite definitive therapy, are going to progress and have a, have a biochemical recurrence or a rise in the PSA. So Alec, you're in Southern California, you got a fairly large group down there, and actually a very interesting group in that you have incorporated a lot of different specialties, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about later. So when, when you manage these patients, either after radical prostatectomy, radiation, cryo, and you see a biochemical recurrence, what are sort of the triggers that you use to determine when to start androgen deprivation therapy, those types of things? So there, there are probably several subtypes, right? The, you know, you, in, in post-radiation therapy patients, you have a nadir, and there's probably a different definition for when you consider a, a biochemical recurrence versus the post-radical prostatectomy. So post-radical prostatectomy patients should have PSA zero. So any rise in PSA is a signal that there's biochemical recurrence, whereas post-radiation therapy, you really need to reach the nadir, and there are different sets of definition, maybe twice the nadir value. But in any case, when this occurs, obviously patients are, are highly anxious. And as a physician, you're, you're really charged to, to, to evaluate the situation and advise them. And so typically, because the patient's anxiety, as well as the physician wanting to treat and facilitate the patient's uh, uh, process through this. You, you, you know, the traditional thing is you, you start thinking, when do you want to order bone scans and CT scan? And we all know that at low PSA values, bone scans, CT scans aren't really necessarily that sensitive to pick up met metastatic lesions. So I think typically, you know, you wait till it reaches a certain level, and, but that level is variable. I don't think it's really, it's, it's, it's highly variable based on the patients. It's, it's, really a, it's really a shared decision process in that. But I, I think with the availability of the new imaging modalities, which I think is the focus of the conversation, that has really shifted. And at least in my practice, you know, we obtain bone scan, CT scan, when they're negative, then this, that's when we go on to the more advanced imaging and we're lucky enough to have fluciclovine 
imaging PET CT scan in our areas, and that has proven to be very valuable. Okay. Neil, anything to add with that? Yeah, no, I think uh, Alec uh, it takes on a, a summary of a, of a complicated issue. With, uh, what kind of, what was their primary intervention? You know, historically, we have kind of reflexively said, okay, biochemical recurrence, let's institute androgen deprivation therapy. And over time, we've recognized that it's, it's not a free lunch. You know, ADT has a lot of consequences. Uh, you know, from cognitive dysfunction to you know, hot flashes, loss of sexual function, visceral weight gain, um, uh, and, and quasi-metabolic syndrome. So I think there's been a real pendulum shift to say, uh, what can we do to avoid that reflexive ADT? And as, as Alec mentions, and I know Phil Koo can talk at, at great length about the flucyclovine test, why are we getting it? Because maybe it's now a great opportunity to treat um, low volume recurrent disease, either with radiation therapy or possibly surgical extubation. You know, these oligometastatic disease uh, states rather than reflexively starting ADT. So, you know, we, we don't have a lot of level one evidence for it, but there's a lot of really good studies that are looking at that. And I think that's a really important take home message for the audience to recognize that a lot of this data will be forthcoming.